Now I want to give an overview of some of the most important parts of the rigid body simulation. As a first step, I want to point out something we need to pay attention to. This is the basic setup that you would get when you add the rigid body simulation to the spaceship. I mean, without any adjustments that I made. And you most likely also got this. Let's try out the game. We've got something strange. This object is thrown away very quickly. Let's figure out what's going on. This is also helpful for looking into an aspect of rigid body simulation. As we add the simulation, in the scene property section, there is a body world tab with some general properties of the rigid body simulation. There are three useful properties to look at. Speed refers to the speed of the simulation as a whole. For example, if we change the value to 0.5 or 0.2, the animation moves more slowly. This is the value I set in the last lesson. Split impulse is a useful tool for making the simulation more stable. For example, as we've already seen, this object acts in a strange way. This is something that often happens in simulations like these. When objects are close to each other, they sometimes seem to explode. This may be because of how they interact. By turning on the split impulse property, it may help to stabilize the simulation. The last parameter, substeps per frame, is related to the number of calculations done for each frame. So, when we have a fast simulation with a lot of collisions, it can be helpful to increase this value to make the simulation more accurate. So, if we slow down the simulation a bit, turn on the split impulse property, and increase the substeps per frame, we can get rid of the strange behavior we had before. Also, look at the orange bar just below the timeline. It refers to the parts of the simulation that have already been saved in memory. The color changes when we change a parameter, like the speed in this case. And in order to calculate the simulation correctly, we have to play from the beginning, from the first frame. If not, the simulation can't be computed. This is also true for all simulations in Blender. Now, let's think about the object's properties again. We've already seen that active and passive properties, the mass, and the animated property. Then we have some physical properties, like friction and bounceness, that are similar to what we saw with the particles. For example, if we set the friction to zero, the spaceship seems to float on ice. In our case, the spaceship hits a rocky ground, so we expect the friction to be high and the bounce to be low. We can apply the same properties to the ground. When we start the animation, it runs until frame 250, where it stops. This is because we can set the cache length in the rigid body world properties. And the end is exactly at frame 250. We can, of course, change this value to make the simulation run for as long as we need. And the orange bar reaches this frame as well. We need to pay attention to the fact that 350 frames are already in memory. This is another important aspect to think about. Remember that Blender can only cache simulations of rigid bodies in memory. I mean, you can't save them to a disk. And it's important to know this.
There are also buttons for managing the cache. By clicking bake, we start the simulation's calculations without playing the timeline. The orange bar turns brown. The simulation is stored in memory and played from there. If we change a parameter, we can't see the result until we delete the bake and do it again. Now we have a new simulation that includes the last property change. Remember, when working with rigid body simulations, you can improve the simulation's performance by baking it. And this is different from what we saw when we just played the timeline. But this also means that if you want to change some properties, you must first delete the last bake and then bake again. Getting back to other parameters, we also have the damping property. As for the particles, it means that the object's motion and rotation slow down after it hits something else. This can be useful when we want an object to stop moving after it hits the ground. Deactivation is also a very useful property. It stops an object from moving when its linear and angular speeds drop below a certain value. This basically means that if an object's speed is very slow, it becomes an inactive object, and its simulation stops. This can be helpful when some objects keep moving on the ground, even though friction or damping is high. The collision shape is the last factor we need to think about. Basically, when two or more objects collide, Blender has to simulate the way they interact. Well, when we have a simple object, like a box or a sphere, it is easy to figure out how they interact. But for complex meshes, like the body of the spaceship, it can take a lot of processing power to look at the exact shape of the object. This is why we have this collision shape, which is the shape that Blender uses to figure out how objects interact. It makes the computation easier. For example, if you choose box, the collision shape will become a cube. This is the real shape that interacts with other objects. The same idea applies to the other shapes as well. But, of course, this can be helpful when the original object can be approximated by such shapes. And in our case, we can't do that. Most of the time, the convex hull is the best choice. It can't be seen in the viewport, but it's basically an envelope around the object. As the name suggests, it can only be convex, which means it can't be concave. Imagine putting a bag around the object. This is the best way to find a balance between how fast the computation goes and how accurate the shape is. If we want a very accurate representation of the object, we have to choose mesh. In this case, the collision shape is exactly the object's mesh. The problem is that this takes a lot longer to compute. Well, in the next lessons, we'll learn how to add a camera to frame our scene and better adjust the simulation parameters.